I want to, this is what I want now. All right. Hello and welcome to Human Design Catalyst. It is February 6, 2023, and I am Jonah Sage Dempsey, and I'll be doing a talk on bonding, connection, and partnership analysis. So we're coming up on uh, Valentine's, uh, 12 days away, and uh, and, uh, you know, it's funny because humans have something very different from mammals, which is that we don't have a mating season, but we kind of do. We have a vestige of a mating season, it's actually right around now. So it's funny because uh, well, one of the key changes that occurred in our, our biological evolutionary history was humans actually um, did away with, you know, we are actually fertile all year round. But a lot of mammals have particular times when they will mate. Um, and I think there's, there's you know, many reasons for, for th that, one of which was actually a sort of, um, yeah, sort of uh, a leveling of the playing field between um, the dominance of the masculine and sort of the ability to use sexuality as a sort of countermeasure because uh, as much as um, men have dominated and uh, you know and there's been you know patriarchy over time and so on there there have also been uh, this is something we study in base theory that um, you know, when you look at the bases, the most masculine of the bases can use force to dominate, but the most feminine of the bases, the double yin, can use sexuality to control and to manipulate. So just something to think about as we go into Valentine's Day. And of course, I don't mean to attach that to either, um, you know, either gender because, or any gender for that matter, because uh, these are just things that are available to us as humans. If we try with force and it doesn't work, we can, we can use a light touch. And I think part of that was this generalization of sexuality. One, um, diverging from sexuality for procreation, and then two, ditching the mating season so that sexuality could be used any time of year as a sort of, you know, you're not really mad, come on, you know. And, and, uh, and so, um, but historically, this, this would be the time. And in fact, the gates that you see uh, from Aquarius into Pisces in this time of year and springtime there is such a thing as spring fever, and it is kind of a, you know, a throwback to the historical mating season of um, pre-human mammals. So in any case, today we're going to be uh, covering a, a lot of ground, and um, I'm going to start by going over the lines, which we were all talking about just before we started the recording, so that would be good. We kind of have a little refresher on the lines, we'll be talking about how the lines bond, the bonding strategies, and also the tribal roles of the lines. And for that, um, you know, I'll just kind of be, uh, may, might rely on a few people in the audience, which may be off screen, but just, you know, I'll just say for any three fives here, or if anyone wants to chime in with stories or anything about if they relate to any of these uh, characterizations or not. And then once we go through the lines, we'll be looking at uh, how do you analyze partnership? How do you analyze two charts? And it's not just romantic, although that is kind of the theme, but how do you, how do you analyze any, you know, two friends? How do you analyze family members? How do you analyze business partners? How do you analyze uh, any, of, any of these connections? And I'll be giving you some tools um, to do that. So you can do that on your own and, and with, with a partner, if you have a partner, or just, you know, to have these kind of in your bag of tools to draw from. So let's begin. So the bonding strategies of the lines. Um, we're going to start with the first line, and these are these are just fundamental requirements of something that needs to be there, to be even to be able to befriend that person, to be able to bond with that person, to connect with that person. Depending on what your profile is, you're going to have a different way of connecting, and not everyone connects the same way. Uh, for the first line, this is the theme of the pursuer or the pursued. Now, traditionally, um, it could be the male pursuing and the woman being pursued, but it's really not like that at all. I mean, it, it, it can go either way. Uh, it's, but to give an example, I know two one threes who were married, and uh, after some years, um, she was complaining, you know, I just don't feel like I'm pursued anymore. I don't feel like there's a chase anymore. I don't feel like 
there's any, but it, you know, it's kind of it's kind of funny. It's like who really cares if you're pursued or pursued, pursuing or pursued. Either way, you're running after. You know, you're, either way you're running. Either way you're being run after, or you're being chased, or you're chasing. And that element of the chase is so important for a first line. First line needs an element of a chase. Like I, you know, first line's not going to be interested in someone if they're not going to pursue them a little bit, and they move a little closer, and the first line moves a little further away. Are they going to keep moving closer? Or the other way around, they start to leave, and then the first line, well, wait a minute, now I have to chase you. you know. And, and that push and pull of that kind of game of tag is so crucial um, to the first line bonding. It's so important that they just have a little bit of a, a game there. Um, I mean, this is really a very fundamental genetic strategy. These are genetic strategies. And this is the cave person strategy. And what the cave people did? Well, they would, they would go out, and if they could catch the one, then they would club them over the head and take them back to the, to the cave. I mean, this was, it's like, so you either tried to run away, or, you know, you tried to, to chase, and how, how much effort is put into the chase versus how much effort is put into running away. And if someone doesn't run too much, they kind of want to be caught, well, what's the fun there? You know, and if somebody doesn't chase too much, oh, what, they're too lazy? I'm not good enough that you won't chase me? What's the big deal, right? I mean, it's... So these are fundamental genetic strategies. Now the second line is one of my favorites, the shyness boldness. This one, you know, people can get so hung up on this. And, and, and you know, also by the way, we tend to get fixed in one or the other, depending on the person that, that we're with. And it tends to always go to that side. Like a second line child might be really shy with one parent and really bold with the other. And then the parent they're shy with is saying, how come you never sing around me? You only sing around your dad. You only sing around your mom. This is, it's, it's basically the shyness and the boldness. It's also, it can change too, because it's when they're shy and when they're bold. It's kind of using shyness as a genetic strategy. How does that work? Well, shyness puts up a wall and it says no. And that wall is just absolutely not. And so then the person breaks down the wall, very similar to the first line kind of. You can see that these are very fundamental. As we get to the, the higher lines, they're sort of later genetic strategies that were later evolutionary developments. But um, at, this, at this very basic level, uh, the second line just says no. And it's very important for second lines to say no. So, so let's see, we have, yeah, we have three second lines here. It's very important as second lines to say no and to see if they're willing to keep pushing and it's not some kind of no means yes thing. It's more like no means not right now. And if you want to try again later, it might still be no. And try again later, it might still be no. Okay, now it's yes, you can walk me home. But no, you can't kiss me. You know, that's still no. And then they keep trying. And then, and so, you know, it's basically putting up the wall uh, so that the, the other person gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper in until the second line finally says yes, and all those doors have closed behind them, and they're so deep in, and they've been waiting so long, and they've invested so much in the relationship, now they're really, now they can't get out. You know? <laughs> it's a genetic strategy. If they just said yes the first day, the person would leave the next day. But now it's been six months, and they're so invested, and they've tried so hard, and they finally you know, get it, and then they, they can't get out. So this is, this is the, the you know, fundamental role of shyness or boldness. The third line, we have a lot of third lines here. And then we have six lines who are either in or coming, just coming out of their third line phase. The third line is so overrepresented in the world. Yeah, we have three three fives, but then we also have a four six and three six twos. So talk about all those third lines. Um, the third line is bonds made and broken. And this can be you know, breaking up and getting back together again, but it doesn't have to be. It can just be uh, sleeping in separate rooms, and you break the bond every night and you make it again in the morning. I mean, it can be um, having the leeway to leave and return to the relationship. It can be seeing each other every two weeks and having two weeks off. It can be seeing each other a couple of days and then not seeing each other for a couple of days. Uh, or it can be more significant. Sometimes the third line will break a bond for a long period of time, for months at a time and then remake that bond. I, I like to say, you know, because the third line, it sounds like a penalty, it sounds like a punishment to not be able to just stay in, in the thing, right? And it sounds like, you know, well, how come I can't just be comfortable staying in it, just making the bond, and then the bond is just made, and that's it, I don't have to leave. Well, you, the way I say it is, you get to have a thousand first dates. You know, you get to date a thousand different people, all in the same person, because each time you remake the bond, you're basically, remaking it, 
it's like that LCD sound system line. Um, love is like an astronaut. Uh, it comes back, but it's never the same. You know, after you've broken that bond, and then it comes back, it's not the same love that was there before. Maybe you've been with different people. Maybe you haven't. Maybe you've just been, been a Zen monk sitting in your retreat. Whatever you've done in that time away, it's never the same coming back. It's never the same. And so the best relationships for the third line are the ones where they're allowed to leave and come back and to consciously make and break the bond. I had a 3-6 uh, girlfriend, uh, you know, partner, and we would actually send emojis. She traveled a lot, and she would like, go to New York or something and send me, like, scissor or something. It was like, we're breaking the bond, or like an explosion emoji, or, you know, like, this is gone, <laughs> this is done. And then, you know, she'd come back, and then, you know, we'd get back together and she'd send me chains or something like that. You know? So it's kind of like, you know, you're, you're, as long as you're consciously making and breaking the bond, it's not, it's not a problem. It's only a problem when you can't surrender to that and when you expect it. But by the way, I mean, third line keeps things interesting. I mean, a relationship that doesn't go through changes is not a living relationship. So. The fourth line, is the confidant or not? Now, the fourth line you can never really tell if you're friends or if it's something more, I mean, no matter how long you're friends with a fourth line, it could always turn, I mean, the longer you're friends with them, the more chance it could turn into something. This is, this is the conversion of friendship into romance. And again, if we think of it as genetic strategies, you know, there's some fish that are male fish that pretend to be female fish, so the other male fish won't fight them, and then they get to be friends with the female fish, mm -hmm. and then, bam, they have little baby fish, you know, <laughs> this is the fourth line. They kind of, uh, they pretend to be the opposite gender a lot of time. No one really gets to see um, into the other gender, how they talk, you know, I have fourth line friends who are women, and I kind of treat them like guys, and I kind of tell them, like, hey, I've been seeing this woman, and she's kind of like this, and you know, they, they get to hear a different story than, than the other women in my life. Um, and it doesn't have to be about gender, it can just be about bonding, about, about bonding through friendship and through brotherhood, sisterhood, or I guess siblinghood, or you know, bonding through fraternity uh, in that sense of the um, you know, egalitarian collectives. All of this is very fourth line. All of the, there would be no Red Cross without the fourth line. I mean, one of its keynotes is the, the magnanimous. And, uh, and so the fourth line is really here to kind of, they like everyone until you've crossed them. And, or, interestingly, um, they have the theme of kindness until sexuality begins. And the moment sexuality begins, it's going to start the, the theme of meanness. And so it's really interesting, it can be shocking for people how a fourth line has been their friend for so long and then they cross that line. They cross the red line, whatever that red line is, you know, sex, or maybe it's just kissing, or you know, whatever that line is, they cross it and then the meanness starts. And wow, you've been so nice to me for so many years. Why are you on my case now? Why are you... Why are you nagging me, or however it's seen as, you know? Or why are you controlling me? You know? These are the, the complaints. But, but the fourth line, you know, if you're in a relationship with the fourth line, it's just so important to, uh, to really treat them as a friend and tell them exactly what a friend would tell them. I had a 4-6 come to me, and she wanted relationship advice, and hey, you know, fourth line, I mean, we're going to bond and talk about relationships. And she's seeing a guy and, and sharing about it, and she said, I want to know if this sounds legit or not. He said that, um, I can't really, I don't have the exact words, but he gave her a very frilly speech that was nothing like what he would say to a friend. It was like, I'm looking deep within myself and I need to really go on a retreat to discover what my higher self wants for my future and all these things. I, I just said to her, I didn't say like my opinion, I just said, well, does that sound like something he would say to one of his friends? You've hung out with him and his friends. Did he talk to his friends that way? She goes, oh, no, no. He doesn't, he's just like, hey, guy, what's up, bro? Like, he's not like, talking like that at all to them. And I said, well, that's your answer. He's not talking to you like a friend. Mm -hmm. For a fourth line to really be in a relationship, they have to treat you as a friend. And if they are, then, then great. But if they start to put up these walls and they start to tell you a different story than they're telling their best friend, you know, the fourth line, you should be their best friend, right? And here's the thing. Profiles, you don't have to have the same lines as the person in the profile. It's nice when you do. You have a great companionship there, but you don't need to have that. I mean, a fourth line can be just like, I'm not a fourth line, but if I'm in a relationship with a fourth line, we have to be best friends. Just like because I have a first line in my profile, there has to be an element of pursuit. You know, it has to be, uh, you know, and, and so on. So w the lines that we have are requirements for us to really open up and bond with someone. And we can't do that unless that requirement is met. Now, the fifth line is the seducer or the seduced. 
I remember when I first learned this, and I, I remembered how, you see, because again, these get stuck in the binary, and I, I've been in a long-term relationship with a 5-1, and I'm a 5-1, and um, she had seduced me, and it's very uncomfortable being seduced, because then if they leave you, you can't get them back. See, when you're the seducer, you can always get them back. You always have their, you have the key to their lock. You know exactly what to say, what to do. You kind of, and you're both fifth line. You're, you know, there's actually uh, three, three fives here, uh, and your fifth lines as well. And so there's an element when you're a fifth line, you have to feel, even if you're both fifth lines, you have to feel like you're getting a good deal there. You have to feel like you're punching up, so to speak. You have to feel lucky that you've gotten somebody out of your league, even if you're both fifth lines. You have to both feel out of each other's league in some way. And if you don't, it's not going to work because you're going to just feel like you didn't really go for it and seduce and you know, get the partner that, that you could have gotten uh, were you able to, to seduce them. Um, and it can be very, you know, it's interesting, but the, the seduction theme is really a theme about you know, it's a theme of you have to feel like you're getting the good end of the deal. And you have to feel like, wow, this person is like so much, like I am so lucky to be with this person. Like this person, I never imagined I'd be able to get somebody like this, you know. I mean, she's like this, he's like this. Like I never imagined that I could, that, you know, that they would even notice me. I thought that I was just some petty little thing and that they would just overlook me. But somehow I ended up with them. And if you feel that, then you, the relationship can work. But if you don't, if you feel like, ah, eh, well, you know, then it's, then it's not going to work. Um, because that is the, the seduction. The seduction has to really feel like it's seduced somebody that it wouldn't normally get, you know, someone really special. And that brings us to the sixth line. And that is the role of soulmate or not. And the soulmate, you know, this is a, this is a rough one because um, the sixth line goes through its third line phase. And when it's in its third line phase, it still has dreams of the soulmate. It's just not yet ready for the soulmate. A lot of six lines don't want to hear this, that the soulmate is really there waiting for them in their flowering. And the flowering occurs at the end of the three-part life process. So the sixth line, the first part of the life process up to the Saturn return at the end of their 20s, is, a, is trial and error. And it's really a descent into pessimism. And during that time, they're looking for the soulmate, but they're not really, they might think they have the soulmate. And it is true, some six lines have stayed with the same person since their high school sweetheart all the way to their 50s and 60s, that's, you know, and beyond. That, that is the rarity, and when that's happened, they've had to really reinvent the relationship in very significant ways. Um, because the sixth line soulmate theme, it's kind of like having a dream of the soulmate and then giving it up completely by the end of the 20s. So there's no such thing, it's a complete myth, it's fake, it's a sham, it's a lie, <laughs> you know, total crap. And then, <laughs> And then, but then they go, okay, but I can make do. I can make do. I can be in my relationships now in my 30s with a newfound distance where I don't make their problems my problems. You know, the sixth line in their 30s is like, yeah, I'll date you. Just don't bring me your health problems. Don't bring me your money problems. Don't bring me your relationship problems. Don't bring me crisis and drama and all this. You know, I could put up with, with a lot of things in my 20s I can't put up with anymore in my 30s. And that's kind of, as the sixth line goes on the roof, it's sort of, yeah, I'll be there for you. I'm just not going to be there next to you in the hospital from your overdose or whatever. You know, it's, I don't have the energy for that anymore. Um, and then the, the, the 30s and the 40s are kind of this, this long period of time of, of watching and waiting. And then it's actually going back to optimism. And by the end of the 40s, the optimism is there again. And then in their 50s, it's something that's neither pessimism nor optimism. I mean, I would call it realism, but it's not even that. It's beyond realism and idealism. It's the synthesis, it's the true synthesis of something that only you can see and only you can be, you know, um, being and seeing. These are the six line themes, you know. It's, it's truly being yourself and kind of going beyond these binaries and, and really knowing when to be optimistic and when to be pessimistic and knowing when to be idealistic and when to be realistic and being able to just to, to fluidly synthesize and move through these themes. And that's when the soulmate really reveals themselves to you, because that's when you're, you're able to kind of handle it. So the sixth line is kind of the, the longest process in that it, it goes through these changes. Any questions, or shall we continue? Any comments from the sixth lines? <laughs> um, so that, that like hyper distinction of the sixth line, like the being the role model of the, the, the role model being the thing that uh, you're an exemplar of yourself. So the soulmate, to me, it's like the soulmate. Ross says that no matter what, it's not what you expect. 
and that each sixth line is going to be expecting something different. So the fantasies that they have when they're young are unique to them, and that's what they cast out. And so the example of the sixth line who is with someone from high school up until the age or whatever, these are probably the people that are sitting with that suspicion that the surprise is that it is that person the whole time for that. You know, I see. No, it's like no matter what, life finds a way to surprise you based on what your expectations are. They were ready to soulmate. break up, and then exactly. they get to be surprised that actually they were with the soulmate all along. Yeah, yeah, the person yeah. they were looking elsewhere. That's, That's going to be, be some thing. people's story, right? And then a very other people are going to have to be surprised in different ways. Mm -hmm. Right. They're going to think that they were drawn to this kind of person, but actually they were drawn to that kind of person, or yeah. think that, yeah. That's a really good point. Thank you for that. Okay, so I'm going to go through the 12 tribal roles. I know this is a lot of information, but we'll just be kind of, we'll be treating it lightly. And um, these are actually, we're going to go through the lines again. So we already went through the one to six. We're going to go through the one to six again. Um, for the more technical out there, this is just a note saying the 27th gate is tribal externalization, which is giving. So uh, we actually just had the nodes going to 27, 28. So we're all going to be conditioned to give our give of ourselves more, mm. um, but you know it's it's gate of nourishment and caring and so on. You have please, I don't know, because I have fifty. It's my son and Earth. Oh, that's yeah. oh well, no wonder. Yeah, I, I I have fifty and I have an undefined spleen, and so twenty seven is always bringing a lot of comfort as you have, and uh, cooking that wonderful soup. Uh, I made a little video of that soup, and it got some acclaim on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the soup video. But anyway. So the, the 27th gate is really the tribal giving, and then the 59th gate is the tribal internalization theme, taking. And when I say tribal here, um, that's in reference to the circuitry group. There's collective circuitry and individual circuitry. But tribal is this kind of um, how, we, when we're in any sort of bonding situation, uh, family, um, lovers, friends, business partners, we look at tribal. So. There are collective roles, there are individual roles. They're kind of like masks. Like, have you ever been thought you were totally alone and then someone sees you and you kind of like change your face really quick and you're like, I don't want you to see that expression. Well, that's because you have your individual face on. Or, you know, I'm out in public and I kind of have my collective face on or I'm giving a talk to a room of strangers and I have my collective face. And then afterwards, I'm, yeah, you wouldn't believe what they said to me. I'm, I'm kind of more casual and that's my tribal face. And even with this, it's kind of like we were drinking mezcal and sitting around and my tribal face, and then they're like, oh, John is a little stiff now. He's on TV or you know, <laughs> something like that, right? It's, as we, we change. So what we're going to be doing is just looking at the tribal roles. And um, these are actually drawn from the six lines of the 27th gate and the six lines of the 59th gate. The 27th gate is the genetic imperative to give our energy to others. And the 59th gate is the genetic imperative to reproduce. Uh, it also has to do with bonding and fertility. And these are part of the defense circuit. And People have kind of heard my joke of how um, the 59 on the emotional side is just looking to bond. It's sort of a sexual, um, what would you call it, the hustler in a way. It's, it's, it's just trying to, it's knocking on the door and it's just trying to kind of bond so that it can leave. And it's really there to cut through defenses and break down barriers and it's there to, you know, meet someone at a bar and hook up something like that. And then on the other side, you have the 27, which is about child raising, and, and really is about, well, it's about caring, and caring what your kid eats, and caring who they hang out with, and caring when they go to bed, and caring what they watch, and caring about this, and caring about that, and all the different things you care about in raising, raising a kid for 18 years. And I, I like to joke, if you switched them, it would take 18 years to choose who to have sex with, then you have a kid and just drop them off, at the, you know, and you're done, <laughs> you know. That's, uh, well, some people do that, actually. You know, it's called giving up for adoption. Maybe they don't have gate 27, you know. But in any case, um, you can see how different those two things are, how the caring is a process that really is meant to take at least seven years, but, you know, sometimes up to 18 years or beyond. And, um, and uh, on the other side, it's really just about bonding. And so from the six lines of these two gates, we get the 12 tribal roles. And this is kind of a small graphic, so don't, don't be intimidated. I'll just kind of go through them. Um, so the first line bonding role is, is going to be at the externalization, this is the selfish. And people don't like to hear this. They don't like to hear, please have a seat. Right? They don't like to hear the selfish because there's such a stigma against it. You know, what does this mean to be selfish, to externalize selfishness? Well, everyone has a different role to play. And really, the first line is just, it's kind of just meant to get, what it, it, get its needs met first. 
and it's meant to actually put out selfishness that can empower others to be selfish. Even this is kind of what it externalizes. It doesn't mean that it's actually selfish internally. Like it's not actually it's giving selfishness. That's, that's the funny thing about it, right? What does that even mean to give selfishness to others? I mean, there's a certain healthy self-absorption to the first line which is that they need to have their solid foundation. And if they don't, if they're not deep in their thing, there's going to be problems in the relationship that requires a certain amount of what is seen as selfishness. But on the internalization, we have the penetrator. And this is a really funny keynote here. What does it mean to take in in a penetrating way? Well, when a first line meets you, they don't automatically trust you. They watch you. They penetrate you. They penetrate what you say. They look for slip-ups, they look for little mistakes. Is this person lying to me? Is this person telling me an untruth? Something Ra would always say to parents of first-line kids is, never lie to them, not even about Santa Claus. Not even about Santa Claus. Because it doesn't matter if it's a little white lie. It doesn't matter if it's the tiniest lie in the world. They will know, because they're listening in a way that penetrates the lies, and they will lose trust for you. They will only trust you to lie to them. They're not going to trust you to tell them the truth anymore. And so there's going to be this sort of adjustment phase where the first line, when they're meeting someone, you know, over the first three months, six months, and beyond, really. Um, I mean, <laughs> Ra liked to joke, you know, he would say, well, I'm a 5-1, it only takes me 10 or 15 years to trust you. Don't worry. <laughs> only about 15 years, then I, then I trust you. <laughs> it's, you know, it's because it takes that long to penetrate fully and to kind of make sure, to see what the other person is really made of, and to see when they're, gonna, when they're, when they're telling the truth and when they're not. Now, the second line has an externalization theme of the giver and an internalization of the loner. It's funny, we don't often see second lines as givers. We don't, but, you know, they, they are. They, they're actually, they're giving when they're called to give. The second line is, is actually waiting to be called. They're waiting for the right should, you know. You should show up to this. You should do, you know, uh, I have a, a good friend who's a 2-4, Von Paul. People who watch my you know, YouTube see him a lot on there. And um, I tell him a lot of shoulds, and most of them don't make it very far. You know, most of the shoulds just fall flat. But I said, you know, you should make something for Christmas. Oh, he made a, a hit, you know, a total hit. Amber, who just came in off, off screen, but she's, um, you know, you give so much. And it's, I see it when you're, it's like, you're not seen as a giver until you give. And then it's like, wow, you give so much. And that's what the second line is here to externalize. Um, but, but the internalization is the loner. And that's always, as they're taking things in, thinking, well, I could do without this. I don't really need what this person has to say. I don't really need what this person's giving me. It's like the internalization. See, but, you know, by the way, internalization, externalization, these are really about um, how we listen and how we speak, or what we're keeping secret, hidden from others, and what we're broadcasting to the world. And people get them backwards. So, so many second lines broadcast being a loner. They don't need to broadcast that. For instance, um, it's not one of the tribal roles, but uh, the third line has, um, I think it might be individual, of the pessimist is internalization theme. And uh, the pessimist, they don't need to externalize their pessimism. Someone can tell you, this is amazing, it's going to work perfectly the first time. And you can internalize that with pessimism of, it's never going to work. You don't have to tell them that, because the moment you start broadcasting that pessimism, then people say, why is that guy so pessimistic? Or why, you know, and you start to get a, a kind of a bad rap for that. But this is just how we take in. So the second line is really there to kind of take in as a loner, as someone who doesn't really need others. Even if they do need others, they're just here to kind of listen in that way and think, ah, I could do without this, you know, or do I really need this in that sense? Now the third line, we have the themes of the driven and the adventurer. And by the way, you can play with these keynotes in your profile. Like a 1-3 is a penetrating adventurer. You know, that's quite a, that's quite a, uh, <laughs> or, um, you know, you can see a 2-4 is a magnanimous giver. Or uh, the loner companion, which is kind of a funny <laughs> mix of the two. You know, how can you be a loner with a companion? But we have these tensions built into our chart. So the driven and the adventurer. You know, externalizing drive. What is it to externalize drive? That's, that's what you're really here to broadcast. You don't have to internalize it. Someone can come to you with something and try to get you jazzed up about it. You don't have to be jazzed up about it. But what you put out in the world is this driven, jazzed up, we're going places and we're doing things and we're gonna, we're gonna see the world. We're not gonna give up. There's more to this story. There's more to this life. We're gonna see what's out there. We're gonna experiment. 
we're going to try it out. You know, it's very driven, and it's here to sort of externalize that ambition and drive. And then internalizing is the adventure. This is an ear for adventure. Always having an ear for, ooh, there could be an adventure there. There could be something there I haven't done yet. There could be something there I haven't seen before. As you're listening, you know, thinking of, of, of the adventure. The fourth line is the magnanimous and the companion. And you know, some of these don't need a lot of explanation. You know, as we were talking about the fourth line earlier, you can kind of see it. It's here to externalize. The magnanimous is, I am the friend of everyone. You know, unless I don't like you. But, you, it's, but the fourth line never doesn't like someone for any There has to be a reason. You know, it has to be one of their friends doesn't like them, or they've been wronged by them, or they've started sleeping together. There has to be some reason. <laughs> you know, it starts to switch. It's also but, like the benefactor after being beneficiary. That was one of the keynotes Raw would use. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, it is. It is um, well, and the magnanimous is the ultimate benefactor of kind of um, helping, helping people. And, and you know, being a beneficiary as well at times, but um, for the fourth line, the, the magnanimous is really, it's a Robin Hood theme. It's sort of like, if you have a friend who has a hot tub, then all your friends now have a hot tub. Mm -hmm. your friend's place. But that friend that has the hot tub might not get anything from you. You know, some people get, some people give. This is kind of how it goes. Um, and then the internalization is the companion, and this is really how they're here to listen. Now you can see how when they go around broadcasting, I'll be your companion, I'll be your companion, I'll be your companion, that's not a, necessarily a good thing. The internalization is almost meant to be kept secret. It's like you're secretly being their companion as they're telling you their problems. You're kind of building companionship with them, but you're not necessarily broadcasting that. You're broadcasting, yeah, I'm magnanimous. I help those who are in need. I help the poor. Yeah, that's me. But you're not necessarily broadcasting that you'll just be anyone's friend, even if they do pick up on that. And then the externalization of the fifth line, the executor. I used to joke, um, so the fifth line, if, if you're in a relationship with me, I become the executor of the estate, basically. Or unless you're a fifth line as well, in which case we're both kind of helping each other in that regard. What is the executor? You know, they, they do the taxes. They uh, make the plans. They, they call the cable company to get the bill reduced. They do all the boring executor type stuff. Because one of the keynotes also of the fifth line is practicality. The executor is very practical. Now, um, my partner at the time didn't like this, but I used to joke with her. She would say, well, you went out on a date with this other woman, and I'd say, but I'm not doing her taxes. You know? <laughs> I mean, it didn't really get me very far, so I don't recommend that. But, uh, but, you know, the executor. And then the internalization is the seducer, and it's dangerous when fifth lines start to externalize that I'm the seducer, I'm the seducer. You know, that's the Don Juan archetype or the Casanova who kind of is trying to seduce everyone and wearing their seduction on their sleeve. No, it's meant to be an internalization theme. I like somebody, and as they're telling me things, I'm playing with my cards very close to my best. They don't know that I like them. They don't necessarily know. But I'm watching and I'm looking for ways to seduce them. I'm taking notes of the things that they like internally so that I can kind of uh, you know, know my way in and know kind of what to say and, and what, what keys I might have that might unlock um, things for them. And then finally, we're at the sixth line, and this is the realist and the dreamer. And how perfect for the sixth line. They have these two keynotes that, are, that seem so opposite. And they can be so reversed. So many sixth lines can externalize their dreaming and seem like such dreamers. And then they listen with this harsh realism and no, that'll never work and so on. It's exactly backwards. Anytime the sixth line hears anything, they're really meant to hear as a dreamer, to listen as a dreamer, to hear as an idealist in, a, in, in that sense of what could be possible of how it could be different or it might work. But then what do they externalize? The realist. They're not gonna go around externalizing their dreams to everyone. They're gonna say, no, this is the way it is. This is the reality. You have to accept it. You can't just, you can't just dream it away. You can't, you know, that's wishful thinking. And, and so this is kind of what they, they give to each other in, in you know, relationships. Now, of course, the sixth line is not going to become a realist uh, or a dreamer even, um, until they are into their 30s, really. I mean, they'll have glimpses of it, but they're mostly going to be driven adventurers until then. They're in their third line theme. You know, throughout their 20s, they have so much drive and, they have, and ambition, and they're, they're looking for the adventure, and they're getting mixed up in all different things, and it's really only when they go into their 30s and beyond that, that, that these sixth line themes occur. Okay, well, that was a lot. How are people feeling? Should we uh, do the second half next week, or do people want to get a few? Should we do a five minute break and then? Yeah. Let's do a short break. Short break. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That, was, that was a lot of information to take in. So. Yeah, so. Wow. <laughs>
And you know, we can uh, we can always do uh, the second half next.